Hi. I just want to introduce you to a little bit more of greater things. So much of what we do and what we're about is all about connection. We want to help people connect with God and we want to help people connect with themselves and also connect with each other. Uh, we really feel that this is tied up in uh, Jesus' commands, if we can even use that language, of uh, when he's asked what are the greatest commandments in the Bible, he refers to two from the Old Testament. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. And the secondly, which is equally as important as the first, let me just come back to that phrase in a second, but is to love others as you love yourself. Why I love that concept that the second is equally as important as the first is that Jesus is introducing us to an understanding of the power of love, the power of connection. And so he's putting loving each of us as we love ourselves in the same conversation as loving the Father with all our heart, soul, mind and strength. Now, uh, for this, this guy <laughs> who was raised in a uh, conservative Baptist environment, uh, it was always God first, and then everybody else was uh, like a distant second. And when I mean a distant second, uh, so often our church's theologies are around serving others before we even think about serving and loving ourselves. Um, but in my journey, and with Trish as well, I've discovered many things about the kingdom of God, but I've also discovered many things about the power of loving ourselves well. Uh, and the truth and the revelation of what Jesus gave us 2,000 years ago was that if we can love ourselves well, then we'll be loving others well. And so I think there, there is a real, um, there's a beautiful revelation hidden inside of that one little phrase of Jesus. The second is equally as important as the first, love others as you love yourself. And, and so for Trish and I, often when we're sitting with people, the question is, how are you loving yourself and are you doing it well? Now, for many of us, uh, particularly as an Australian man, uh, loving yourself well, uh, well, that wasn't a term of endearment when I was a kid in the 70s and the 80s. If you loved yourself, uh, uh, well, that was a term that would actually be quite sarcastic or uh, quite attacking uh, your identity and so often we would avoid that sort of language so when it came to me being an adult teenager into adult years of loving myself well all I knew how to do was what I'd been taught to do through all of those early years I looked after other people often at the expense of myself as I grew up in, in church and in church life, there's always something to do. There's always some ministry or function that you need to be at. And uh, there's always not enough hands and uh, there's always something to do. And I found myself in this constant pattern of serving, but not loving. Now, I'm not saying serving is a bad thing. It's not. But when you put it at the expense of yourself, well, I'm just not really sure that's the way that we are designed to be. Jesus would come on a little bit later with another word, and he says, I've got a new commandment I'm giving to you, and that commandment is to love others as I have loved you. Now, for the one who is love, to say, here's a love that you can model. Here's a love that you can share. This is not just God's love in heaven that occasionally you tap into. This is something that Jesus was releasing on the planet. He was showing us the love of our heavenly dad. What did that look like? Well, to a woman who was known as a prostitute or an unclean woman, she came and cried on his feet, um, anointed his feet with perfume, and, and everyone else in the room was condemning her except for Jesus, who was just affirming her. The love that she carried is a love that she would share, and she was pouring it out so abundantly with such abandon right there with Jesus. And right there we get this taste of what it looks like to love as Christ has loved us. And then you, you go to another passage in John 8 where Jesus is um, 
uh, out and about and all of a sudden here's this woman who's caught in the very act of adultery being thrown at his feet and the Pharisees and religious leaders try to push him into a corner theologically so that either his life is at stake or her life is at stake because the law of Moses says that she must die but if he says that she must die then he's going to be guilty of that uh, because he's not allowed he's not a Roman he's not in authority to say who can die and who, who can live and so they thought they had the perfect storm of a question for Jesus but what they didn't understand that in those perfect storm moments Jesus is the one who calls calm and peace and like he did on the water with the disciples he did right there in that very moment and he is down on the ground and he starts writing there in the dust and he says anyone who hasn't sinned you can you can cast the first stone and right there in that moment is option C there was a she dies, option B, he dies, or option C. They didn't see that one coming, but this is what love does. This is what love does. He asked the woman, where are your condemners? And she's like, they, they've gone, Lord. And he goes, nor do I. Again, we get to see the love that Christ has loved us with. And it's, it's, uh, it's here. It's, it's right here within us. Each of you carry it. Each of you know it. For many of us, we've doubted that kind of love because we've learned love in strange places or dysfunctional places. And we hear in the Bible of an unconditional love or a love that you can trust, a love that's faithful. And for many of us, we have not had faithful love or trusting love or unconditional love. Uh, for me and for Trish, this is part of the reason or much of the reason why greater things exist. We believe greater things will happen when the love of God is truly manifest and his people is where he has entrusted us to love well as we love ourselves as Christ has loved us. This is not a new way of thinking. It's an ancient way. It's 2,000 years old. When Jesus said, I've got a new new way of living or a new commandment, a new, a new thought bubble right here for you all, I want to show you what it looks like. He spoke it, he taught it, but then he modeled it. He was criticized, he was condemned, he was persecuted, he was misunderstood. If anyone felt like a square peg in a round hole, it would have been Jesus at that very time because it, even with the disciples, like, wow, when are you guys going to get this stuff? This is what love looks like. Uh, he asks who's the greatest in the kingdom of God and, uh, and he looks around and finds a child and he says right here, if you can believe like a little child, the kingdom is yours. No wonder whether the people listening were thinking this is a metaphor. This is surely not... But Jesus is like, no, no, no. This child knows what faithfulness feels like. This child knows what truth feels like. This child knows what faith looks like. This child knows what love feels like. Let this moment and season for each of us be an opportunity for the Spirit of God to redefine what love is for us all. The words of the Bible are not just a good idea or an ideal. They're designed to show us God's story in action, the love of God in action, and what the love of God can actually do. So my friends, this is just a short video, but I just want to introduce you to the heart of connection that Greater Things is. Bless you all. Connect with Greater Things International on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube or at greaterthingsinternational.com.